Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> what is grace? When Paul wrote his letters, he used a very consistent greeting. <clears throat> we could read any letter, but I'll uh, read it from Philippians 1. <clears throat> Philippians 1, verses 1 through, 12, 1 through 2, rather. It says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, and then verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As we did in our recent Bible study on the Holy Spirit, we often cite this greeting while making the observation that Paul referred to the Father and to Jesus Christ, but left out the Holy Spirit. This is one of many proofs that argue against the idea that God is a trinity. But that is not the reason that Paul is using this greeting. He's offering it as a type of prayer that the Father and Christ would grant us two things, grace and peace. We also cited these greetings in our study on the uh, fruits of the Spirit and pointed out that peace which we discussed in our Bible study on the fruits of, the, fruits of the Spirit, is one of those fruits. And Paul wished his recipients peace every time he wrote his letter. But what do we know about grace, which he also included? What Just what is grace? Well, perhaps we've heard it described as unmerited pardon, I remember hearing that as a definition years ago. When I looked it up on the internet, asked what is grace, the most common interpretation that I found is unmerited favor. And many people have proclaimed grace to be a free gift from God with nothing required of us. Grace is a massive subject. And I cannot possibly cover it all in one message, so I'm going to confine my comments to one particular thread. The church has a booklet on grace entitled, What Does the Bible Teach About Grace? Much of what I will be covering is presented in that booklet and a lot more. But today I would like to give an introduction to what is meant by grace in the scriptures. We don't tend to use the noun grace as much as Paul did, who used it over a hundred times in his letters. He not only began his letters by using the word grace, as I cited earlier, but ended almost all of his letters with grace as well. Perhaps some of you are still in Philippians, where I started this message. If you are, turn back to the end of Philippians. Should be on the same page of the previous one. Ephesians 6, 24. He says, Grace be with you with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. And similarly, he finished most of his letters with some comment about grace. <clears throat> Although we don't use grace often as a noun, we do sometimes refer to someone as being gracious, an adjective which includes the idea of kindness, courtesy, good taste, generous spirit, mercy, and compassion. These attributes comprise the noun grace as well, although, as we will see, as is applied to God, there is much more to it. We also speak of being in someone's good graces. And this concept, too, is very much related to the use of the word grace. Turn over to Genesis 6, and we'll see this. Genesis 6. Beginning in verse 5, Genesis 6, 5, Then the Eternal saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, the Eternal was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Eternal said, I will destroy man that I have, 
whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But, as we read in verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the first time grace is used in the scriptures. It comes from a Hebrew word translated grace 38 times in the Old Testament. The concept is not foreign to the Old Testament. But it's also translated as favor 26 times. For example, in Genesis 18, Genesis 18, we see the story of Abraham greeting several of the uh, uh, a, a contingent of three people that he is at least eventually decides is a heavenly uh, manifestation. And in verse 3 he says, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Favor here is from the Hebrew word for grace. So I could have read, My Lord, if I have now found grace in your sight. When Moses asked God to show him his glory in Exodus 34, Exodus 34, he, um, God told him, well, I'll do that. But you can't see my face or you'll die. So I will show you my back parts. And as he walked past Moses, he said in verse 6, as the eternal passed by him, he proclaimed the eternal the eternal God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Here God specifically calls himself gracious, taken from this same Hebrew word for grace. But he also lists a lot of other attributes, long-suffering, goodness, truth, mercy, and forgiveness. These are all aspects of the word grace, as we'll be seeing. We'll see more of this when we get to the New Testament. All of these attributes are a part of grace. Continuing with verse 8, Moses made haste, bowed his head toward the earth, and worshipped. And then he said, If I have now found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. So here Moses is specifically asking God, in his grace, to pardon his people. In Psalm 84, we'll see what David had to say about grace. Psalm 84, verse 11, David said, For the eternal God is a sun and shield. The eternal will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. This idea of not withholding good things is a part of grace. It's one of the things that God gives, good things. In Proverbs 3, Proverbs 3, verse 34, Surely, Proverbs 3.34, surely he scorns the scornful, but he gives grace to the humble. So even in the Old Testament, God is depicted as being gracious, anxious to give grace to his people, especially those who are humble, which includes his favor and gifts of knowledge, glory and wisdom, mercy and pardon. But it is in the New Testament 
that we see grace expounded the most. The first time grace shows up in the New Testament is in the book of Luke. We're going to look at Luke 2. Luke 2 and verse 40. This is speaking of Jesus. And it says, The child grew, waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. For those who think of grace as meaning unmerited pardon, think again. Jesus was not in need of any pardon whatsoever, merited or unmerited. Even the idea of unmerited favor, which is another favorite meaning of some, is called into question here. Jesus did not receive unmerited favor with God. So while God may sometimes grant us grace when we don't deserve it, I don't think it's fair to make unmerited a part of the meaning of grace. In this case, the favor of God was upon him, although it was more than just favor. I'm sure he was granted every possible gift imaginable. The Greek word for grace is charis. It's defined as grace, particularly that which causes joy, pleasure, gratification, favor, acceptance for a kindness granted or desired, a benefit, thanks, gratitude. A favor done without expectation of return, the absolute free expression of the loving kindness of God to men, finding its only motive in the bounty and benevolence of the giver. Very long description, but the upshot of it is a lot of good things and a lot of good attributes. It is the generosity of God springing forth from his love. A related word is charisma, a word we have borrowed in English, but in the New Testament, charisma is almost always translated as gift something provided through charis, or grace. As with the Hebrew word, favor is one of the meanings of charis. If you look down at verse 52 of Luke 2, we'll read, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Favor there is that word charis. Jesus increased in charis, or grace, with both God and man. But grace encompasses not just favor. It includes all of the gifts and blessings God bestows on us, undeserving as we may be. It includes God's mercy, his forgiveness, his love. Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 16. Second Thessalonians 2:16. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our, our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So here we are directly being told that hope is received from grace, as well as consolation. And it's implied in verse 17 that comfort and good words and works are also coming through grace. In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3. We start here with our customary greeting from Paul, where he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 4, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which is given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched 
in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here in this uh, long Pauline sentence, Paul introduces us to the grace of God, and he describes it as in allowing the people to be enriched in everything, that the testimony of Christ was confirmed in them. He talks about no, uh, not being short in any gift, and he talks about them being blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are all elements of the concept of grace. Ephesians 1, verse 2. Ephesians 1 and verse 2. We will start out with a familiar sentence. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. All part of grace. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption by sons, as sons by Jesus Christ in himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. So here Paul is addressing the idea of receiving forgiveness and being sought, being looked at as blameless. And this is all done through the good pleasure of his will. All part of grace. To the praise and glory of his grace. In Romans 3.24, Romans 3 and verse 24, we read that we are justified by grace. This is being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So another thing that God does through, through his grace, through his uh, attributes of love, is to justify us. And in Titus, we'll see what he has to say to this young preacher. Titus 3 Paul says, as he's uh, giving Titus instructions, he says, remind them, the people under his care, to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey and be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works by righteous, of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So here once again, we're being told specifically that we're justified by his grace, but we're also being told of the kindness and love of God, his mercy and the gift of the Holy Spirit. I submit all of these are part of the grace of God. Grace, meaning uh, the word charis, and for that matter, faith, which is the word 
pistis, had meanings in the New Testament era that predated what Paul wrote about. And the meanings that they that they were the people in those days were familiar with were meanings that Paul obviously had in mind when he wrote about grace and faith. In the time of the apostles, there was a system known as patronage that existed in the Roman Empire. Patronage did not carry with it the negative ideas that the word conveys today. A patronage relationship was looked on positively. and would have been regarded as something good and lasting with mutual benefits. It involved a wealthy patron who could provide money or support to one or more clients. Usually it was support that could never be repaid. And as a result, the client was usually indebted to this patron for the rest of his life. It wasn't exactly slavery, but it was a relationship that was very close. Was, as I said before, it was very positive. And there are examples in scripture that seem to reflect the type, this type of relationship of a patron and a client. For example, some people would open their homes to provide meeting space for the church. They were acting as a patron in that case. In Romans 16, we find a, a mention of a deaconess. Uh, it says, uh, I commend you to Phoebe, in Romans 16, 1, I commend you to Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Sincrea. I called her a deaconess because servant is taken from that word deacon. So effectively, she was a deaconess in the church in Sincrea. And he says that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. The word translated helper here is only used this one time in scripture. And the defini definition includes the idea of being a patron. In fact, the English Standard Version ESV even translates verse 2 as, she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. It indicated her generosity on acts of service to Paul and others, placing her in the role of a patron. The same seems to be true of Theophilus. Theophilus was the patron who supported Luke in writing the books of Luke and acts. The formal relationship between patron and client came with certain rules and expectations between the two parties. The patron would provide certain benefits, known as caris, protecting a client's economic, social, and legal interests, even helping him profit from the patron's social connections. The patron might purchase all of the client's manufactured goods, for example or give him access to his friends for making additional sales. In return, the client was expected to demonstrate gratitude and loyalty. This loyalty given in return was called pistis, and it's the same word translated faith or faithfulness in the Bible. Charis, as demonstrated by this patronage system, came with obligations especially for the client. In using the word charis or grace, the New Testament authors had this idea in mind. Grace involved God providing mercy, forgiveness, gifts of knowledge, his law, the gospel of the kingdom, and especially the gift of the Holy Spirit. But in return, in accepting his grace, we are obligated to show obedience, loyalty or faithfulness, pistis, and gratitude. 
Take a look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Here Paul is specifically re referring to the idea that grace should result in thanksgiving towards God. If you go back a couple chapters to 2 Corinthians 2, in verse 14, 2 Corinthians 2, 14, it says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Thanks is the word charis. So here the, uh, the translators are drawing a direct relationship between thanks and charis. I suppose they could have said, now grace be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, but it's specifically here referring to thanksgiving. A relationship is set up between us, all of whom are in need of help, and God, our patron and benefactor. Grace is freely given, but it is not free. We have obligations to God for providing that charis, that grace. Grace is the very nature and character of God. And as God is developing his nature and character in us, we in turn have the obligation to show grace to others. We're in 2 Corinthians, let's go over to chapter eight. We'll see, a, some description of that Paul is giving regarding an offering that he's wanting the Corinthians to make for the saints in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 8, he says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So he's referring to God granting grace to the churches of Macedonia. But then it says that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So here he's talking about what their reaction was to the grace of God. He refers to their joy in verse 2, and he talks about the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Gift there is that word charis. So he's referring to the gift as a, specifically as an act of grace to the, to the uh, saints. In verse 7, therefore as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. So by referring to this grace also, he is, also, he is essentially implying that knowledge, diligence, love is also a grace, but he wants them to abound in this grace also, which is coming up with a donation for the saints in Jerusalem. In verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And in verse 16, but thanks, and once again this is that word, charis, thanks or grace be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. In verse 19, not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, that charis that we saw earlier, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself and to show your ready mind. In the next chapter, chapter 9, in verse 8, we read in God, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, 
that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So God is providing grace to us, but he's expecting something in return. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God, for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of his minist this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. In the book of Ephesians, Verse 4. We'll read one verse there, Ephesians 4, 29. Paul talks about communication. And he says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the brethren, or unto the hearers, it says. So here Paul's... Uh, saying that good communication should be edifying, and when doing so, it will minister grace to the hearers. In Colossians 3, Colossians 3 and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. As we're singing here, are we singing with grace in our hearts, returning that grace to the Lord who gave it? In chapter 4 of Colossians, verse 6, he goes back to the subject of speech. and says, let your speech always be with grace seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Philemon was an interesting person that uh, Paul talked to. I won't go into all of the elements of his letter, which is a study in psychology. But in verse 3, he starts out by talking to, addressing Philemon, and he says, very familiarly, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 4, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus, love, faith, good things, all elements of grace. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Joy, in this case, is actually charis. So we have great grace and consolation in your love. Grace was not unique to Paul. James, Peter, John, Jude, they all discuss it. As with Paul, they often begin and end their letters with grace. Let's take a look at 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1, he starts out his letter by saying, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Slightly different wording, but the same sentiments that Paul addresses. And if you go to the end of the book, verse 38 of chapter 3, he says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. I'd like to go back to 1 Peter, though. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. 1 Peter 4 and verse 8, we read, Above all things have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. 
Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, and that word is charisma, which as we know is related to charis, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace, charis, of God. So he's expecting that in having love to one another and being hospitable, we are exhibiting grace. There is much more to grace than I have had time to cover today. I have not, for example, addressed the relationship between grace and sin, or grace and law, or even elaborated on grace and faith, subjects which are covered at length in the booklet on grace and other church publications. Instead, I have focused today on the nature of grace as God's love, kindness, mercy, forgiveness, as a gift of God's spirit, knowledge, and wisdom, and our obligation as recipients of that grace. We need to be thankful and faithful in our relationship with God. Grace is the very nature of God. He expresses it to all of his creation, whether merited or not. In Matthew 5, Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, and verse 45, Matthew 5, 45, we read, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And this is in the context of loving even our neighbors, or our enemies, rather. And we need to learn to exercise grace with others as we develop God's character, God's grace. The means of doing it is with one of the gifts of God's grace, his Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 1, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6. 2 Timothy 1, 6, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift, charisma, of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. I've pointed out that the New Testament writers usually began and ended their letters referencing grace. This is even true of the book of Revelation. If you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 4, after a brief introduction, we read, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And if you'll turn to the last verse of the book, the last verse of the entire Bible, I'll leave you with these words. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.